Up until now, we've created applications that allow the user to input information, but we've never really done anything useful or meaningful with that information that they've input. We're working towards creating a full-fledged application in day four, and that application will involve the creation of notes typed in by the user on the input scope uh, that will be associated with a particular physical place in the world by saving off the uh, latitude and longitude or the city, state, and country where that note was created. At any rate, we're going to need somewhere to save that note that the user creates and some way to recall those notes as well. Uh, so we have a couple of uh, choices that we can make. Uh, the easiest way is to tackle this problem using the phone's own storage capacity, its flash drive, to store the information. In Silverlight applications, you don't get free access to the entire phone's file system. The user is protected from potentially malicious applications, and it does it by providing uh, each application with its own personal storage area that's called isolated storage, which makes sense because each storage area is isolated from its neighboring applications. So how do we store and retrieve data from isolated storage? Well. What I want to do in this video is create a couple of simple examples that should get you pointed in the right direction, and we're going to continue on with this thought in the next video as well. We're going to start with the standard setup. As you can see here in Visual Studio, I have a project that's called Isolated Storage. And what I want to do is add a number of buttons into the, uh, the content panel. And in addition to those buttons, I want to put a uh, text box as well. So I have some already defined and on my clipboard. I'm just going to paste them in and you can see now that I've got three buttons, save, clear, and open, as well as a text box uh, that is named info text box. So you can duplicate this by just kind of getting close or you can copy and paste uh, or pause the video and, and take a look at the settings that I've created for each it's not really important where they're lined up. The only thing that's kind of important here is that we set the vertical scroll bar visibility equal to auto in our text box. Okay, so the next step is to create the event handlers and then write code for each of the three buttons. So what I wanna do in the button save is right click on the click property and I want to navigate to the event handler. And so now I'm going to type in some code that is going to address the isolated storage and it's going to create a file and save whatever the user typed into the text box into that file. So we're going to do it like this. Okay, so as you can see inside of my save underscore click event, First of all, I'm creating a new instance of app storage, or I'm sorry, isolated storage file uh, by creating a variable called app storage. And as I hover over, you can see that this get user store for application will return the, uh, the current user scoped isolated storage for use by an application that calls from the virtual host domain. In other words, it's gonna retrieve a, uh, a reference to an object that will allow us to interact with this specific application's uh, isolated storage area. And so that's what we're saving off into this app storage variable. Now, admittedly, you may have never seen this var keyword before. Uh, it looks a little bit odd, admittedly. Uh, we've not talked about a data type called var yet. It's a special keyword called local type inference. So C Sharp will assign the data type when the application is compiled based on what the variable is initialized to. So C Sharp will figure out the data type for you that's returned from this get user store for application. So at first glance, this seems both great and incredibly dangerous, but it's necessary once you begin to use some more of the advanced features of the C Sharp language when it's not always clear what the data type will be. This is a rather advanced topic for the moment. Just suffice to say that in this case, C Sharp is gonna figure out the data type that's returned from this method, get user store for application. And, and it creates a reference, a variable called app storage of that type. 
So get user store for application returns a reference to this application's isolated storage space so that we can write and read files from it. Uh, so what we're basically saying here is C Sharp, go ahead and figure out for us what the return type is and then create me a variable based on that data type. That's what the var keyword does, okay? In this next line of code in line 30, we're basically just hard coding the name of a file, simple.txt. This will be the file name that we're going to store on the phone, and we'll use this later on as we're writing to a new file. In line 32, this might look a little bit odd as well. Uh, let's start with the inside part and then work our way out. First we have, let me scroll over just a little bit, this var file equals app storage .open file, and then we're passing in some values like the file name that we just defined right up here. And then we're going to also tell it uh, the file mode. How do you want to treat this file? Well, either we're going to open it up if it exists, or we're going to create it if it doesn't exist. So that's what that parameter means. That's what the file mode means. We'll see a different file mode in use in just a moment as we begin to open up the file and read from it in another click event. Finally, we want to give uh, permissions on what type of activity we want to perform on the file. Do we want to let uh, to only read or do we want to allow also read and write? So in this case we are going to allow for writing. So the, the data can be can be written to the file in this case. And the reason we have to tell it up front is we're essentially asking permission of the .NET framework to please open up the file because we want to write to it. It may tell us, no, you don't have the permission to do that. Uh, however, I anticipate for our simple application, this is going to work just fine. Okay, so then let's work our way out from this just inner part. You can see here that we're setting a file equal to this open file, it's going to return back an isolated storage file stream. Now I don't want to become an expert in what's returned from this open file method. So again, I'm using this var keyword, the local type inference. So as we're declaring file, we're going to let C Sharp figure out what the return type is from this open file method and then create a reference to that. And we're going to let C Sharp figure out what the data type is to that reference. It's as easy as that. Now as we work our way out, we're going to see this using statement and it wraps our line of code with an open and close parentheses. Now in this context, the keyword using forces the file that we're working with here inside of the, inside of the open and close parentheses to close once the end of the code block is reached. So once we have performed this code block, and we exit out of that code block, then this file is closed and uh, it's, we're no longer holding on to it, in other words. So this reduces the possibility that I accidentally leave the file open and accidentally corrupt the file somehow when I attempt to open it a second time and write more information into it. So using defines a code block. And once the CLR is finished executing the code block, then the file will be closed automatically. Basically what happens is this reference will be set to null and it will go out of scope and it'll be removed from the phone's memory. So line 34 is similar to line 32 in so much that we're using a using statement again. This time we're creating a reference to a stream writer object. It's an object that knows how to write data into an open file and all the low-level details are hidden from us, and thankfully so. So all we need to do is pass the file reference that we want to write into when we create a new instance of the StreamWriter, and then we'll call the StreamWriter's write method down here in line number 36 to actually perform the writing of the text that's contained within our info text box. I would encourage you, if you look at this and you're like, whoa, this just blows me away, please don't be discouraged. If you're dutifully following the series in order and you're truly in your third day, I've got nothing but the highest admiration for you. This is not easy stuff. And truth be told, very few people can do this right off the top of their heads, even with years of experience. They may have seen examples online or in books, or they generally know how to read and write from a file because of, of experience of doing it over and over again. With this as your first exposure to this type of code block, 
and even some of the keywords like the var and the using and so on, I wouldn't expect you to just grab this and, and run with it on your third day of writing software. Most people poke around in IntelliSense. They may rewrite the code a couple of times. You know, when I create these videos and I do some preparation beforehand, uh, I am doing that so that I'm not fumbling around while the camera's on. Uh, truth be told, it took me a little bit of time to figure out exactly how I wanted to write this line of code. You don't see all of that, but you have to trust that even people who have some experience uh, often aren't able to just hit a home run on their first time at bat when writing code like this. So take some comfort that it's not as easy as it looks and that it'll take days, weeks, or possibly months of hard work just to know where to look for solutions like this off the top of your head. But you can do it. Many people, probably not even as smart as you are, have done it. Uh, the only difference between you and them or between me and you is that I've, I've just devoted more time to it than you have in my life up to this point in time. Okay, so enough pep talk. Let's get back to work. One last thing, if you ever run into a word or a line of code that just doesn't make sense, I encourage you to stop immediately. Pause this video or pause what you're working on or stop reading and go to bing.com and then search for that word and find some help on msdn.microsoft.com or some blog post and then start reading. Spend some time. Don't just rush past it and just steal somebody else's code snippet. Read until you get a firm grasp on exactly what that code word is or that block of code is doing. Many times it's going to lead you to related concepts that are going to require more and more reading. Don't cheat yourself. Right now you're developing a mental model of the .NET Framework class library and it's going to require that you immerse yourself and explore in a lot of different directions and uncover a lot of different information so that uh, you get some of these basics firmly ensconced in your mind. Okay. All right, so let's move on. Next up, what I want to do is write some code for the clear button. And this will be a lot simpler. What well, all we're going to do here as we navigate to the event handler is just clean out whatever text is already in the text box so that we can demonstrate that this actually will work the way that we have intended. And that's all that we need to do there. Next up, as after I save here, is I want to write some code in the open. So the idea here is now that we've saved some data to the isolated storage, now I want to retrieve that simple.txt file from isolated storage and then display its contents into our info text box. So I'm going to get started with a slightly different technique. Okay, so in the open click event handler, I'm taking many of the same steps that I took in the save click event handler. So if you see here in line number 48, I'm getting a reference to the application's isolated storage area. Now admittedly, I did this a little bit differently than previous. Uh, I put it this time in a using statement, but I really wouldn't have to do that. I just chose to do that. In lines 50 and then in line uh, 50. One, I guess, or 52, what I'm basically doing is just using a stream reader as opposed to a stream writer as we used earlier. So this time I'm using it to get a reference to this simple dot text file. Uh, and I'm opening it up for read-only access. As you can see here, I'm opening and I'm selecting read for the file access type through that enumeration. And then in line number 52, I'm using the stream reader's read to end method to take care of the hairy details of retrieving the data uh, from the simple.txt file so that I can display it in the info text box. All right, so let's actually now try our application and see if it works. First of all, I'm gonna just try to build the solution and see if it even compiles, and it does. So that's a good first sign. Now I'm gonna start debugging. Uh-oh, looks like we had some problem here. Uh, all right, if you ever see this error, please take note that you have to select the Windows Phone 7 emulator. I had device selected. For some reason, uh, my uh, Visual Studio 2010 Express for Windows Phone started 
wanting to default to the to the device instead of the emulator. It took me a, an hour of my life to figure out exactly why that was. All right, so at any rate, here we are within our application now, and I'm going to hit the page up button on my keyboard, which should allow me to start typing. on my keyboard. Okay, famous quote. And what I'm gonna do is click the save button and hopefully it won't blow up when I do this. Okay. And now I'm gonna click the clear button. And now I'm gonna click the open button. It should retrieve that uh, that text that I wrote earlier from the emulator's um, you know, flash drive, or really the phone's flash drive, and it seems to have worked. That's outstanding. Very cool. So now we've learned how to save data into a file uh, on our phone's file system using isolated storage. Now, there's one quick gotcha that I want to cover before concluding this lesson. If you shut down the phone emulator, okay, and then I'm going to start our application back up. And I'll take a moment here to reboot the emulator. All right, and now I'm going to click the open button. And when I do, I'm going to get an isolated storage exception was unhandled. Operation not perform, um, not permitted on isolated isolated storage file stream. So what gives? You know, we we uh, we should be able to open up the data. After all, it's saved on the flash drive. Well, the reason for this is to allow an easy mechanism to restore the application to a pristine state before uh, beginning saving data and settings. So be conscientious of this whenever you work with the emulator because it could cause some erroneous fits of panic after you've come back from a long weekend hiatus of building your phone application. What happens is every time you shut down the emulator, it will erase whatever's on the uh, in isolated storage for your application. Okay, so just be aware of that. If you were to shut physically shut down the computer or shut down the emulator, anything that may have been saved in isolated storage for your development version of the application will be blown away. Okay, so we covered a lot of great topics in this video, I think, uh, not the least of which was about isolated storage, what it's useful for, and the classes and the code that are required to save data to isolated storage and then to retrieve data from isolated storage. But we also learned some other things in passing. For example, the var keyword for local type inference. So if we didn't want to create, for example, a or if we didn't really want to know the types that are being returned from certain methods, we can allow C Sharp to resolve that for us at compile time by just using the var keyword as we did a couple of times in our application. We also learned about the using statement that forces the closure of certain objects like isolated storage and files once we're finished using them. So when the code block exits, it will remove from memory the reference to those objects. And then we also learned about the emulator and how it treats isolated storage between sessions. When we close it down, it blows away all of the isolated storage values that we may have stored. Okay, so let's pick this idea back up because we have more to say about using isolated storage, especially in the context of building our own application in day four. So we'll see you in the next video. Thank you.